Well, hello there, YouTube. So this week's YouTube video is going to be footage of a painting that is in progress. So here you can see some close-up footage of this painting. It's a model that's uh, look, sitting on a chair and looking down. You can see the hands and the drapery have been painted in, but it's still fairly in a rough stage as it's only been about, I think, um, three days that I've been working on this painting. So it is a 16 by 20 inch oil on oil primed linen and the colors that I am using are lead white number one, chrome yellow, yellow ochre, orange ochre, Indian yellow, cadmium orange, orange molybdate, cadmium red deep old holland, alizarin crimson, raw umber, viridian, thalo turquoise, ultramarine blue, carbon black or vine black. It's one of the, um, basically ivory black, but kind of the fancy Rublev brand. And dioxazine purple is the last one there. And for the medium, once in a while, I am using Neo McGilp medium from Gamblin. And I should also mention, if you are interested in taking a look at the photo reference that I'm using for this painting, please check the description box down below. Also, if you're interested in knowing exactly what materials I am using, meaning the brands and all of that, please check the description box of this video. And so I'm very excited to share this process with you. So this is how I go about working on most of my studio paintings. So if you saw the YouTube video from last week, it was a comprehensive video featuring the beginning to the end of a painting that I worked on for two weeks long, which was a painting that I intend to sell and to show, and hence meaning a studio painting, of course. So this is exactly one of those. So this is exciting because I am showing you a process in which I'm painting, but not really talking, but I'm creating a painting that's more than just a demonstration, but a painting that I would be uh, proud to show in an exhibition or a gallery or something like that. So. This is truly a process that doesn't quite have a tutorial type of uh, mindset, more of a creating an original artwork that I want to display. Now, the important thing to mention is that what you saw first was a brush stroke right in the, in the cheekbone area. So it's rather bold to go right into the lights, usually... In a classical type style, you want to, of course, get your outlines out of the way first and then start to mass in the darks. But usually you can, if you have a toned surface, go right into the lights. And what is a toned surface, you may ask? It is a canvas that has a value on it. The color that you want is usually a grayish brown because that means that your colors, so your lights will look like lights and your darks will look like darks. However, if you work on a purely untoned surface like this, you see how bright this is relative to the face? This would have been a nightmare to work on because my lights don't look like lights and my darks look way too dark relative to this light. So you see the difference between a toned surface and an untoned surface. Also, when you work on a toned surface, just like maybe something like this, you see that you can just leave the tone of the surface to kind of uh, play a role in the painting. It becomes part of the design of the painting. And you can easily tone your surface with oil paint uh, if you have the patience for it. Just tone it uh, a couple days in advance with just black and white. And what I do is I mix uh, black and white with raw umber, alkyd oil paint. And that's what I use to tone my uh, oil primed paintings. When you work on an oil toned surface, it, it's actually, uh, it layers better, the oil paint layers better than if you were working on a um, an acrylic toned surface. And of course, if you have an oil prime linen, you can only tone it with oil paint. You cannot tone it uh, with anything else. And it's a method of working where you work plane by plane. You work one plane at a time and you figure out the big shapes in that fashion. So, this is both a deductive and inductive method of figuring out a painting because it is deductive in the sense that I am looking for 
very definitive shapes, very definitive proportions at this part of the uh, painting. But it's very inductive in the process of which I kind of just go around and look for individual shapes however I feel. So it's not that I started on the cheekbone or the eye to our left because some kind of theory told me to do so. I just felt like it. I could have started with the nose if I wanted to. It didn't matter. I was trying to start off with something that made the most sense uh, to me and felt right. Uh, hence, inductive. So, it's important to mention, though, that each shape that I'm putting in is being mixed on the palette. So I'm using the mix and go technique rather than the pre-mixture technique, which is what I used for all of the Rembrandt Master Studies that I was doing to basically uh, build up my, uh, my uh, painting strength, so to speak. So now I'm using mix and go, which means I'm mixing colors as I go, so that each shape that I paint in has a color relationship with respect to the surrounding shapes. Now, of course, I'm not showing you the photo reference in the footage because this is not a painting video that I intend you attempt to paint along with me because it's only 20-something minutes long. So this is rather, just like last week, more comprehensive, but still guiding you along the process. A bit more exploration goes into this. Now, you see that I was struggling with the placement of the nose. In fact, when I drew the initial outlines, it was more of a kind of loose, uh, kind of a guessing game to figure out where all the proportions were going to fit. So I noticed that I had the nose a little bit too far down, so the nose is kind of blurred because I had to move it up. So at this point, it looks, it looks absolutely hideous, and if I were to be showing you this footage uh, as it was, uh, maybe like 20 minutes at this point, or maybe like... 15 or something minutes, it would just be so tedious and not fun to watch. So I'm trying to show you more of a comprehensive outlook on the real life studio painting. So in an attempt to correct the nose, I went in straight with a mark, straight in with a mark to the mouth, placing where the position of the mouth, knowing at this stage though that there's definitely going to be some push and pull with the shapes. And so learning how to push these shapes around and reason with these shapes is not a very intuitive process. It's something that you really have to uh, study. Study master studies as much as you can. Do as many master studies as you possibly can, whether your favorite artist is Rembrandt, Caravaggio, Velasquez, or whoever and you will inevitably find the kind of um, spatial relationships that are used in those paintings and that can get you out of a difficult situation when you have some kind of drawing difficulty as I did with the nose. Now the hair looks rather abstract, it looks really extreme. Uh, you, you'll have to click on the photo reference so you can see exactly what the hair is supposed to look like. In the beginning it's very abstract, it almost looks kind of like an acorn. So, um, Obviously, I wasn't thinking that when I blocked in the hair. I was thinking more of abstract shapes. But more or less, I had the top of the hair a little too high. So basically, the linear drawing, like I said, was my best guess. So it was a little too high uh, up, thus giving it that egg corn look. But don't worry. When I go in with the background, it will uh, alleviate that egg corn kind of look. There's a lot of orangey hues that go into the reflected light. These days I like mixing cadmium orange with viridian for a nice kind of warmish brown orangey type of uh, color. And I've even used that mixture in uh, different skin tones and the lights as well. In fact, anytime you paint a model that is uh, in the sunlight, it's always going to be more difficult uh, in the daylight than it is with artificial light because the difference between light and shadow is so it's it's so obscured sometimes, and you have to make sure that your lights and your shadows are always well differentiated.
and this is the process that I like to, to go with one shape and move into another shape. Not necessarily in a systematic kind of way, but rather a matter of feel. That the mandible just happened to be next to the ear in perspective. The key word now is perspective. The reason I was struggling with the nose is just because I don't do enough drawings or enough paintings where there is as much perspective as, uh, as what you're seeing here. The model's head is tilted down drastically. I don't usually do that, so whenever I enter a situation that I don't have as much experience in, there's always going to be some difficulties. So if you're painting a model in perspective with their head tilted down or their head tilted up, check the relationship of the ear relative to the eyes. If the ear is higher than the eyes, it usually means that the model is tilted down. If the ear is lower relative to the eyes, ex extremely low, like close to the ear or, or, I mean, close to the mouth or even lower, it means that the model's head is tilted up. But with the head tilts, the most difficult aspect of this is definitely going to be the nose. Getting to nose, the nose to look uh, like it's positioned correctly. And now a little bit of that phthalo turquoise is starting to be put into use. And I do apologize for not showing the mixing footage of the palette. I know that you would probably be interested in seeing that. But please understand when I'm filming these uh, studio painting style YouTube videos, I try to minimize as much distraction as I possibly can uh, in, in the sense that I, if I were to be working uh, the, the camera, moving the camera onto the palette as I was mixing, I may forget uh, what I was doing if I was looking for reflected light on the shoulder or on the cheekbone or something like that. That extra step of moving my camera from the canvas to the palette would make me forget uh, what I was focusing on, which would make me multitask and make the painting much worse. Uh, so that's why there's really uh, there's no uh, palette footage. Speaking of the Thale of Turquoise now, the Thale of Turquoise is also being used in the background closer to the ear. It's a nice kind of fluorescent looking light when you mix it in. I'll tell you a fun mixture is Thale of Turquoise, which is, um, again, that's a Winsor Newton brand, which is a very nice and vibrant blue, with orange molybdate, which is a really bright, uh, powerful, uh, cadmium scarlet looking color. Uh, made from Rublev. Orange molybdate is a lead, uh, it's a lead orange, a lead orangey uh, red. Same goes with chrome yellow, it is a lead yellow. So just like anything with lead in it when it comes to oil paints, paint with it, don't mess with it kind of uh, mindset goes into play. But you can see how the nice blue fluorescent color, it, it emulates the daylight, uh, the strength of the daylight. And that reflective blue on the neck also kind of gives more of that daylight glow. A lot of what I'm trying to capture in these paintings involves uh, natural light, the glow of the light. There's even a greenish aspect to the shadow tone. Notice that nothing here goes deliberately gray or deliberately brown. In fact, two of the colors that I use the least on my palette uh, are raw umber and uh, carbon black or uh, grape fine black. Basically black and raw umber are uh, and yellow ochre to some extent. I don't use yellow ochre as much either. So I'm trying to create these nice neutrals using the more uh, powerful uh, saturated colors to try to get more of the effect of daylight. And in fact, if you do click on the photo reference, uh, it is from Unsplash. It is a copyright-free uh, resource where you can find uh, images to use for painting. And if you search hard enough, you actually do find some pretty decent pictures to use for photo references. But in fact, I'm combining 
the background color of one picture with the model of another picture. So you'll notice that the background is different in the uh, photo reference that has this model. So now you've seen a camera edit, so some time has gone by and the um, acorn look of the model's hair has now been alleviated, so now you can tell that the model's hair is tied to the back, but it's still um, we've got some braids on the front, even though you can't really see too much detail for it. It's a little bit more advanced than it was before. And at this point, I believe this is already the second day that I've been working on this painting. So you will notice some of the colors on the face will start to sink in, meaning some of the darks will start to look a little bit lighter as the oil is absorbed onto the surface. Working with something that is a white uh, object in daylight, as I mentioned in the previous YouTube video, presents some of the most complex colors uh, imaginable in oil painting. So there is a lot of violet that goes into the, the reflections of the white, uh, some orangey colors. It's nowhere near as colorful as the last YouTube video because the last one was a sunset, was sunset lighting. But there's definitely some kind of greenish colors and purpley colors that show through uh, with the fabric. That being said, I am making all these color relationships up when it comes to the, uh, the, the effect of light. And that is because I'm working from a photo reference, like I said. I don't have the luxury of working from life with a model in the sunlight for an extended period of time. I just don't have that luxury. So I do have to imagine what things would look like if they were painted from nature. Which means, of course, paint from nature as much as you possibly can. Do self-portraits, paint still lives. Basically, just paint from life as much as you can. That's what I mean by paint from nature. So now we're moving on to a yellowish fabric that looked a lot like lead tin yellow to me. Lead tin yellow is a historical uh, lead yellow, which is a kind of coolish yet orangey yellow. So what I used for that was chrome yellow, lead white, orange ochre, and viridian. An interesting thing is to differentiate the yellowish fabric from the skin tone. Now you can tell that the skin tone is very close in terms of the hue to the uh, relative to the yellowish fabric, but it's cooler. So you see that in an extended palette like the one that I have. It's not a lot of colors, but it's enough colors to help you differentiate between these shapes. That being said, in terms of the drawing, I had to move the arm. I don't know if you noticed it, but I had to move the arm, in particular the elbow. I had to move the elbow up. Once again, a drawing mistake, I had it too far down. And as I did that, I also made the forearm thinner. But you'll see in a different video clip that the forearm does get thicker, uh, closer to life size, eventually. And it's all about working with the mid-tone range when it comes to uh, the skin tones and the hands. You see some of those warmish reflected lights, not reflected lights, but lights kind of showing through the, uh, the, the fingers. Those transparent warmish colors are mostly derived from alizarin crimson. You see a lot of alizarin crimson, but I dilute the alizarin crimson with a viridian. Now we're painting in a nice uh, sunlight glow onto the thumb. Some of the orange molybdate gets uh, caught in the mix there. And now some of the warm reflective shadows. Always make sure that there's some kind of gesture to the hands that you paint. It was nice that the photo reference didn't have the model's hands balled up into a fist or just laying flat. The pinky is reaching out, the thumb is grabbing the pointer finger, so there's a nice gesture to it. And I should also mention that it may look like I'm painting each section to completion, but I'm not. I'm painting in in a wet on wet a la prima fashion, knowing that this is just a beginning layer. So. I'm going to continue to layer over this.
and you see a very complex color relationship between the skin tones and the uh, yellowish color of the fabric. They're very similar, yet they are differentiated in that the skin tones are cooler. Not gray or, or brown, they're definitely a, a nice neutral. And in fact you can get very harmonious grays and browns with more saturated colors in the daylight. Of course if it was um, in indoor lighting you could get away with a uh, more limited palette. As I should mention there's nothing wrong with mixing grays or mixing browns. It's all about the color relationships. There's no such thing as an ugly color there's no such thing in, as mud in oil painting. It's all about gauging your color relationships. That is, there's no such thing as an ugly color, only a color that is not related properly to its surrounding colors. So just a few more little additions to this painting. And it'll be ready to update you on the next video. So just a couple more seconds of footage here. You can see a kind of cool bluish glow on the fabric. And that's about it. So we will see how much further this painting will be by the time we upload the next YouTube video, which will be on Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember that I am uploading videos 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And I really hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you did, if you found it helpful, please consider checking out my online classes on patreon.com slash artist where you can find more educational content if you want to take your uh, art education with me further. Or if you just want to see more YouTube videos from me, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. That being said, I wish you the very best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.